studying this passage. Now, keep in mind, 40 years of history, having read this passage, I come to it, and I begin to look at it differently. I begin to look at this passage, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't think that's what that's about. I think we've kind of stepped aside from what this is truly trying to say to us. I, I began to look at it differently. Now, there's nothing wrong with using it to talk about stewardship because there is a stewardship message in that passage. But I think there's a bigger point that we don't see preached very often. There's a bigger thing lying in this passage, not lying as in lying as in lying, but laying there in this passage that we need to confront. You see, when we read this passage, we need to keep in mind what it's attached to. It's attached to Matthew 25. And Matthew 25 is attached to Matthew 24. And in Matthew 24 and 25, there are seven parables all in a row that have to do with the theme of the end of time, the end of days. Matthew 24 and 25 are all coming from a, a question that the disciples ask. The question that the disciples ask is, what will the end of days look like? Now here's the story. Jesus and the disciples are in the temple. Now this is in the, the days leading up to his crucifixion, but they're in the temple and they're walking out and the disciples are going around and they're, they're looking and they're like, wow, this is magnificent, this is amazing, this is this is wonderful, this is powerful, and they're walking out. And I think, now this is me, it's not in the Bible, but this is me, I think they are being loud enough about that so that all of the religious leaders hear how much the disciples admire the temple. Why? Because just a few days ago, Jesus kicked over all the tables. Jesus disrespected the temple just a few days before. Now the disciples are going, wow, this place is amazing. They look like a bunch of rednecks in New York City for the first time. This is amazing. Some of you all get that because you've been to New York City and some of you have never been yet. But Jesus walks out front and he kind of turns around and he says, there's a day that's coming when not one of those bricks will be left on top of the other one. And then he walks off. Talk about a cliffhanger. So the disciples, they get Jesus aside a little bit later, and they're like, you know, Jesus, you said something pretty powerful there. What did you mean? So Jesus begins to explain to them the end of days. And he gets down to a point where he begins to talk to them about the end of time in parables. He uses seven parables to talk about the end of time. Now, the interesting thing is, is that in Jesus' explanation of everything, not once does he talk about money. Not once does he talk about talent or gift. Not once does he talk about stewardship. So I began to look at this, and I began to think about this a little bit closer. And here's why I think he's not talking about money or time or talent. First of all, Jesus changes his pattern in how he teaches. When Jesus teaches with parables, you all, you all have read the Gospels, I'm sure. You've run across all of those great stories like the parable of the lost pearl, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the son who runs away and has a good time on his daddy's dollar. Jesus uses a certain pattern when he teaches those things. When he teaches, it follows a pattern like this. Take, for example, the parable of the sower. It's sort of the, the standard for this, okay? The parable of the sower, Jesus says to the crowds, he says, one day a sower is going out, and he's throwing his seeds out into the ground, and, and some of the seed falls on one kind of ground and, and produces something, and, and, and other seeds falls on another kind of ground, and it produces something. And, and Jesus he says, let those with ears hear. A little bit later, the disciples, they catch him outside and they say, Jesus, um, we know what you were talking about, but we just want to make sure you knew what you were talking about. What do you mean? And so Jesus explains the parable to the disciples. 
Jesus follows this pattern when he uses disciples. A parable is told, a story to make a point, that is usually followed by a question by the disciples saying, what did you mean? Then Jesus gives an explanation of this. But when we get to this passage, something interesting happens. The pattern changes. It starts with a question. Jesus, what did you mean when you said that not one brick will stand on the other? Then Jesus gives the explanation in Matthew 24 of what the end of days was going to look like. And he uses prophetic language. He uses apocalyptic language. He uses language that seems fairly straightforward on what he's talking about. Then he launches into seven parables. Which, for us, if Jesus told a parable, then there was a question, and Jesus then explained what the parable meant, then we should be looking for our explanation for the parables back up in what he said. So we need to go back to Matthew 24, where he talks about the end of days. And in that time, in that explanation... Jesus does not talk about money or possessions. Nowhere in the explanation of the end times does he talk about stuff or wealth. He just doesn't mention it. He does not go into any detail. Now, Jesus talked about wealth, did he not? Jesus was very critical of people who put their faith in wealth. This would be the prime opportunity to look at the disciples and say, anyone who thinks that wealth is going to save them in the end of times, it's not going to happen. Jesus doesn't mention it. Jesus talked about possessions. In fact, at one point he says, look, if you really want to know the way to the kingdom, you go and sell all your possessions so that you'll know the kingdom. Not once does he talk about it. He doesn't mention wealth or possessions anywhere in his explanation. What Jesus does is he talks about in his explanation how things are going to go. And the things that he says is, is that in everything that's happening, everything is going to happen around you, everything is going to happen to you, everything is going to be out of your control, but there is one thing that you will be able to control. There is one thing that you will be able to do in the end time. And it is the one thing that is actually referred to just another day or two later in the last days of Jesus' life. It is also something that he's been talking about since the very beginning of his ministry, and it is the one thing that the disciples have been handed to them from the Master's hand. I want you to turn with me to Psalm 123. While you're turning on the... Some of y'all have seen the new dogs, right? Some of y'all have seen the pups. I got Ollie and Dinah. Ollie is a Rottweiler, okay? Ollie is 30 pounds now. He's my, he's my big baby, all right? Dinah is a Doberman. She's beautiful. She's 24 pounds, 25 pounds. Ollie came to us, and he had been trained a little bit. He had, a, he had been a little bit farther along in somebody working with him. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that I picked up on what he'd been trained to, and I needed to bring Dinah along. And so I started working with them. Now, here's the thing. Di uh, Ollie is sharp. Ollie's smart. He don't look bright. You look at Dinah, and you think, that's an amazingly smart dog. You look at Ollie and say, oh, he's so adorable. Ollie's smart. He picks up on things like that. I go around and, I, and I'll have my, my fire jacket or I'll have my, a hoodie on. And whenever I'm going around and I'm walking with them and working with them, I keep treats in this pocket right here. All right? Ollie knows to watch this hand. Because Ollie knows that if this hand goes into this pocket, there's a treat coming out. So Ollie watches this hand like crazy. And when he sees my hand go into this pocket, his eyes light up. Because he knows when I come out, there's going to be something for him in my hand. Now, let's go to Psalm 123. There is this beautiful image painted for us in verses 1 and 2. The psalmist writes, 
To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in heavens. Behold, as the eyes of the servant look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid servant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until He is gracious to us. It's a beautiful picture that, that God is, is enthroned in the heavens and is sitting there and, and, and the, the psalmist is writing, we look to you, God, because we know that when your hand comes down to us, your gracious favor is going to be in your hand to bestow to us. You are going to bring your favor and your grace into our lives. God is the master, right? The word master and Lord is used interchangeably in the Bible. They mean the same thing. In the Old Testament, when you run into the word Lord, more often than not, it is a way of communicating the unspeakable name of God. Yahweh. Lord. Master. In the New Testament, Jesus is called the Christ. Kurios, the Greek word for Lord, Master. God is the Master in our relationship. God brings us into this relationship where God is the Master. And Paul picks up on this so much in his letters that Paul, when he's talking about the relationship that we have with God, he uses a word more often than any other. He says we are, when, we can, when we think about our relationship with God, we are the servant. Technically, we are the slave to God. We are in this relationship with God. We are the servant or the slave, and God is the master. This image from the psalm fits so perfectly with how we understand our relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are brought into this relationship where we are God's servant waiting for God to bestow upon us this gracious favor. But here's the thing. The psalmist looks with anticipation we wait for that which we have already received. We have already received the gracious favor that the psalmist is seeking because we go into verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 123. Be gracious to us, O Lord, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul is full of the scoffing of those who are at ease and of the contempt of the proud. The psalmist moves from praise. God, we wait for your gracious favor that you're going to show to us from your hand to saying we wait for it because our lives have been put upon. Our lives have been racked with the, the ridicule of the world around us. We are put down upon those people who consume and consume and consume for their own easy life. We are living in the midst of people who say, we don't need you, God. And we are full of it. So let your gracious favor come to us. The psalmist is bemoaning this unfair treatment against the servants and says, we wait. We wait, Master for you to extend your hand that will be full of grace and favor for us. But that which the psalmist was waiting upon is that which we have received. Return with me now to Matthew and the parables of the end of time. Matthew and the parables of the end of time. This entire teaching is reminding us that the days that the disciples are moving into are going to be days of contempt. They are going to be days where people live to consume for their own ease. They are going to be filled with the arrogance of the nations. He's reminding them that the people are going to turn against you. How many Christians are bemoaning the contempt 
that is being shown toward the church right now. How many people are saying, we are not free to express our faith anymore? How many people are saying the world, the culture, the nation, the, 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 the rest of the world is, is saying that we can't talk about our faith? How many people have been saying that lately? My response is, duh! Jesus already told us that was going to happen. How did we miss this one? Jesus said, people are going to say, don't talk about your faith. How did we miss this? How did we miss a world of consumerism where people just want to take and take and take so their life will be easy? Jesus talks about it. They're going to consume so their life will be easy and you're going to live in it. How many of us have heard people say, I don't need your religion. I don't need your church. I don't need your Jesus faith. The arrogance of saying, I don't need it. Jesus said, y'all are going to live in it. Are you seeing the point here? We're living these days. We're living in the middle of these times. And Jesus says, in the middle of these times, when these days are ending, when everything is out of your control, there is one thing that you can control as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it's not money. Here's where I'm going to depart from the tradition. The word talent is not a currency measurement. It's a measure of mass, meaning how much something is. Roughly speaking, a talent is about 120 pounds. For those of you who are math wizards, what is five talents in pounds? 600 pounds. Not $600, not $600,000, not $600 million, 600 pounds of something. Because you see, normally a talent would be attached to something of worth. It would be, if it was a count of money, of wealth, it would be a talent of silver, a talent of gold, a talent of coins. Matthew says, the master gave five talents. Vague. Unclear. Gave 600 pounds of something. But here's the interesting thing. We're told that it was 600 pounds of the possessions of the master. But Jesus does not use the word for wealth. Jesus does not use the word for currency. He doesn't even use the word for stuff. The word that is used there in Matthew's Gospel is this is what comes from the master's being. This is what comes from who the master is. That which the master is giving to those servants is not just knickknacks. It's not just items of value or objects of art. That which the master is giving is something that is personal, something that is, that is a true representation of who the master is. The master is giving away himself to the servants. And then each one is given according to their ability, to their power, to do... They are given to the measure of what they are able to do with this thing. The master knows the servant. The master knows what they're capable of. And the master is giving away these things to the disciples and is saying to the servants and saying, I want you to take this and do with it what I know you're capable of. It's not money. It's not stuff. It is something that comes from the essence of who the master is 
and it is something that can be used according to how the master knows we are able to use it. There is one thing in Matthew 24 that Jesus says that the disciples are in control of. There is one thing that has been given to the disciples according to their power and their ability to use it, to be able to go and share it. What we find, let me get past all of this, is that this in Matthew 24, 14 tells us what this passage is about. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Jesus says the one thing that is in the disciples' control, the one thing that we have control of when the end of days is upon us is we preach the gospel. That's the one thing that we have that we can control. When everything is literally going to hell, the gospel is the one thing that we have. That's the one thing that, that the disciples have been given from the Master's hand. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And when He gave His only begotten Son, His only begotten Son walked into the world and says, I proclaim to you the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, that lives will be healed, that nations will be overturned in their arrogance, that those who are bound up in their prison will be released. We are in the end days, y'all. We are in an age of contempt for the good news. We are in an age where consumerism demands you need to take as much as you can to make your life as easy as possible. We are in an age where people are saying, I don't need your religion. We are also in an age where people who have grown up in the church say, I don't need the church anymore. We are living in an age of arrogance. We are living in these end days, and yet the gospel, the good news, is still ours to do something with. To be able to speak into the lives of people and say, you know what, I know you don't want to hear this. I know you want to make a life that's easy for yourself. I know that you don't think you need Jesus Christ, but you need to know something. There is a master who has come into this world and has something to offer us. The master has given into the world the master of our life. Jesus, master, son of God. And we have been told what he offers to us. That which came from the master and that which desires to be master over our lives is not a task of heavy burden. What instead we find in Jesus Christ is that his yoke is light. We find that his life is grace and love. We find that his ministry is healing and reconciliation. We find that his hope is victory over death and a life in into an internal kingdom of light and joy and hope and peace. That's our good news, y'all. That is what we, are, we, are, we have been given from God. We have been given this story that somebody wants to master our life and make our life better in a world that says, I don't need to hear this stuff. It doesn't mean anything to me. In a world that says, no, I can make my own life pretty easy. In a world that says, I don't need your religion or your faith or your Jesus. We've been given this from the master's hand. But what kind of servant? will we be and what will we do with what the master's given us will we be the kind of servant who buries what god has given to us will we be intimidated by the people who say don't talk about your faith will we be intimidated or or run under by the people who just want to use and use and use and consume and say, you know what, I don't think Jesus could do anything better for me. Are we going to be intimidated by the arrogant who say, I don't need you, I don't need your church, I don't need your religion, I don't need that Jesus crap. 
Will we be silent? Burying the gospel in our hearts and never sharing it. Or will we be like that servant who shares the gospel in the small measure that we have received? Will we give what we have the best in order that we can give it to another? Will we take that which we've been given in the small measure that we have and use it so that we can transform the life of another? Or will we be the one who recognizes the abundant, gracious favor that we have been given from the Master's hand? Will we allow our lives to be overwhelmed at what the Master has done for us, so overwhelmed that we're willing to throw everything away and throw everything to the side and throw our lives wholly and completely into the task of proclaiming the gospel. Are we willing to live into sharing the good news of God's grace and love to the fullest measure of what God has already shown to us? The end of days is upon us as it has been from the very first proclaiming of this. The question is, what will you do with what you have received from the Master?